Hello everyone, welcome to another episode of Debatable with your hosts, Nina and Kyle. I'm Kyle. I'm Nina, and in this episode of Debatable, we're doing a debate analysis series, a series of episodes dedicated to explaining the motions of Debatable Open 2022. The goal of this series is to give debaters a brief understanding of the different topics they've encountered if they competed in the tournament, and give those who weren't able to join us a chance to learn from the motions as well. Today, we are joined by Albert Pagunsan, who gave us our topics for the Philippines team of the tournament. Hello, Albert, and welcome to the show. Hello. Hello, Nina and Kyle. Thanks for having me again. Yeah, I was about to say that we <laughs> had you last year. But I feel like the work that you do is so important, especially to, like in today's climate. Right. So could you tell us a bit more about yourself, what you do, and actually about the motions uh, in the Philippines, uh, motions in general? What do people get wrong about it? Like, I know that a lot of people struggle in characterizing certain aspects of the Philippines, mm-hmm. especially like how do you characterize the progressives or sometimes say just blanketly demonize certain actors. Like, what hmm. do you have to say about those things? Um, okay, so I'll just introduce myself. I'm Albert. So currently, I work as the program director and as a volunteer of Fact Check Philippines. So um, the things that you do, you see online, yung mga fake news, uh, we, we fact check that. And I'm also part of this. We're also part of a very huge network. Two networks actually fact checkers. So if you see fake news, do report it to us. There are also debaters who work in other fact check organizations. So we also debate our you know fact checking skills then. Uh, I guess that's what I do aside from being a cat and dog person, as I mentioned in, in the publicity material. So yes, um Kyle asked like um what are the things that we can improve on as debaters when it comes to Philippine motion? Um, I guess the first thing is that unlike what we read online about Europe and the United States about their progressive conservative movements is that while their groups might be a bit hom- um, homogenous or it's very easy to identify them in the Philippines and I would say in the global south it's a bit mixed like for example when you talk about progressive the group is pretty much diverse there are those who are part of the center left and I would classify the Liberal Party somehow to be in that um, part of the spectrum. And then we have the far left or the ultra left, which we can classify usually with the National Democrats or the people who take arms and go to the mountains. We also have the, in the middle of the left spectrum, we have the Kaliodi um, group. So I guess uh, but also, when it comes to the Philippines, we should also understand that people have a huge, um, they have a huge affinity with their region and with their identity as people, not only as part of regions but also part of, as part of religion. Which is why um, I, I will be uh, talking about later about how religion plays a big role in politics. Um, in this case, people don't want to be attacked, you know, surprisingly for their religion. So it's just why. Um, I, I would understand now why um, attacking them for supporting certain candidates does not work at all. It's because they strong uh, have a strong affinity with the regions where they come from, because those regions have a lot of experiences with how they've developed. And you would see that regions that have you know a really wealthy history are more likely to be open to listen to new ideas. Or, or who are open to supporting liberal candidates. For example, Iloilo and Negros, which had their really good wealthy heyday in the 80s and 70s. Uh, but you would see far more very conservative regions and regions that are um, always um, have issues of rampant poverty um, to be less open to political discussions or have a really hard time to opening up themselves to other candidates because of the strong patronage politics because of the strong um, affinities that they have with long-standing political dynasties there. So I guess that while you know we are a democracy, the sad reality is that these are realities that we have to face and have to shed light into when we talk about debate. I, 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 I think uh, if you're a political science major like Nina, she would know about all of these stuff, but for debaters who don't really do political science, these are, you know, the sad realities that we have to talk about in the day. I mean, admittedly, even as a Paul Sci major, there's just too much to, <laughs> to talk about in the Philippines. Like, we don't get to cover everything. That's why it's important we have discussions like this 
and that we talk about these motions, especially as debaters who have platforms to open up about concerns we might have, experiences we might experience, and you know the observations we have about everything going on around us. So you did mention something about religion and our relationship to it, which brings us perfectly to our first motion. And it reads, this house welcomes the endorsement of liberal candidates by religious figures in the Philippines. So the first question I want to ask under this, given that you've already explained that there is a strong connection between our politics and religion, I wanted to ask, how would you characterize this relationship? What, how does it differ from the relationship of religions in other countries? And what makes our relationship as Filipinos with religion so unique? Uh, so yeah, um, it's very timely because before I, I had this, uh, I, I had this talk with debatable. There were some studies that I I encountered while you know reading that actually showed that people have placed God and placed religion and faith largely in their lives. And when I was in college, there were um, a lot of studies about how people are a bit too dependent on what they believe. Uh, Fate or destiny offers for them. So Filipinos are likely to say that bahala nang ang Diyos or would say that ipapasa Diyos ko na lang or would say hindi ko kasi kapalara na maging let's say, um, you know, national champion. So when you know, those ideas are actually very common among people who across all um, ano ba, like socioeconomic bracket, uh, socioeconomic bracket, mainly because of the strong influence that the church has, not only the Catholic church, but also other smaller churches and less powerful churches over the educational system, the experiences and the cultures that we have in the Philippines. And I would also say to an extent, it also stays true for um, Islam in the uh, Philippine South. So I guess with regards to how people are educated and how they experience things in the Philippines, they come to this conclusion that I really very le- I have left agency with how my fortune or how my kapalaran would be like. Therefore, I would just pray and I would let God do all the work for me and I will do my part. So that strong um, relationship with how we are educated because of Catholic rules or because of the cultures that we have like Flores de Mayo, where even if you're a public school student or a public school attendee, you're still, you know, encouraged to go and be part of. And also with how our universities, like our biggest universities, our top universities are largely dominated by Catholic universities as well. So um, that huge network and infrastructure for how we, we think and how we act is already based on that dogma that people have. So that translates to how we also decide and how we view candidates, um, which led me to think about the motion that uh, that we uh, that I proposed and eventually debatable also reviewed and you gave your feedback with it, how it can be written um, about the endorsement of of the church and other church leaders for se- several candidates. So I think it's very interesting that religion is so integral to Filipino life, and I have mentioned this in several other episodes where I was saying that secularism is different here in the Philippines where, uh, for example, in the United States, we see it as secularism as um, secularism as protecting the state from religion, whereas here in the Philippines, you want to protect religion from the state. So you want to accommodate as much as possible religion. So um, I, I really do get, I really appreciate that even here we have some discussion of religion in relation to elections or yeah elections so what i wanted to ask was for government side what are the trade-offs that we're going to expect here because we're talking about liberal candidates here so there are some times that um religious um, institutions sort of go against uh, progressive or liberal values so what what are the trade-offs here like what do we stand to gain as a liberal candidate here I guess for government side, um, you know, aside from the huge network that church has, you can, you know, gain access to universities, which is why you see candidates going to certain universities and they show their state statements of support. But I think that the trade-off that you would face here, which also would uh, be argued by opposition side, is of course in the long game when you are a progressive candidate, the end goal of progressives always is to 
change the system, um, either you're part of the ultra left or center left, there's some recognition that the system needs to be changed to be more equitable or more equal. So you will make those compromises um, either perception wise, because you have to tweak your image after that endorsement, or you would have to change your platform. And when you are seated, when you win the election, you would certainly have to tone down your criticism of the church or certain conservative practices because you owe your um, you know, your position to them to some extent. So opposition, you know, can argue that. And that's the trade-off that government has to take. And I would say government can say that in any elections, in any democracy, you would have to make compromises. And the examples you can show is how in Europe they have coalition governments or coalitions of, of opposition parties when they form their parliaments or form their um, political blocks. Uh, after the election. So, you know, it compromises like part of politics. You can argue that. But I guess also the benefit here is that in the current political climate and even during the 1980s, what the church provides is that given that it's an established infrastructure, and to some extent, people would say that the church is one of the most effective campaigners or effective campaign blocks in the Philippines because you have the huge access is that your image as a person who is questionable to be part of the system or part of status quo is perfectly rebranded or erased because you're now seen as a person, oh, you're part of Philippine society because you're religious or are religious leaders who are largely um, macho or very, uh, very masculine support you right now. So if you are a, let's say, if you're an LGBT candidate or if you are a, uh, from the margin, or if you're a woman, you would largely benefit from that because you somehow get this seal of approval from men who have dominated society. Um, it also gives you some form of shield against red tagging or any acquisitions that um, you're trying to change the system. Right? And there goes also the compromise game again, because you would have to go away for some of the progressive standards that some of your supporters might be very, very um, strongly supportive of, like, for example, abortion, divorce, LGBT rights, and stuff like that. Um, but also, I would say in government, the thing that you can argue is command vote, because given that these are male leaders that are largely respected and communities follow them for guidance, um, they're more like people are likely to consider the candidate in their ballot. I'm not saying that um, people will automatically vote for the candidate just because there is an endorsement. There are some anecdotes, there are some stories, and there are also some studies to say that the, the command vote of certain blocks doesn't really exist. But the influence they have um, over the votes that people have still exists. So the command vote is there. People will be more soft about the candidates that they, their, their leaders are endorsing. Um, for opposition, I guess, uh, you can... You can try. You you would you would have the risk of trying to marginalize a middle class in the Philippines that has been exposed to the church being criticized. And I think the peak of church criticism wasn't only be because of the uh, uh, scandals that they faced in the past administration, but also because the uh, the incumbent president has been very very um, bold about his criticism about the church. So this middle class, even if they might be anti-administration or they might be supportive of the opposition, might be somehow, um, you know, consider other candidates when these liberal candidates are seen to be allied with the uh, institution or infrastructure that they long perceive to be very, very um, somewhat problematic because of the status and issues that they face. Um, lastly, I think that uh, what opposition can argue here is that you can also you would also make you would also further the the relationship that the church and state has as opposed to trying to widen the gap between the two institutions. Because as a progressive, your goal is to ultimately rebuild or build or reform democracy. But in this case, because you are trying to get the support of different religious groups, you're strengthening that relationship again. After Duterte, you know, somehow criticized the church and other religious groups. So you're trying to mend those ties again. That might be um, a bad thing for democracy in the long run. So I guess um, those are the things that can be argued for government and opposition in this motion. Um, my only 
my only reminder is that to, to talk about who are these liberal candidates? Are they running for local positions or national positions? Because that also is an important aspect in the debate and that provides you different types of context. Because if you're a local candidate, it's very easy to you know, pass progressive platform because you don't get to see, you don't get to get the ire of national media or national blocks of political formations like feminist groups or LGBT groups and other progressive blocks as well. So, magkaiba siya. So, kailangan um, just remember that uh, the liberal candidate also have a different edge if they run in local or national positions. Yeah, I'd also like to add that I think for this debate, it's very important to sort of talk about or, or like mechanize how exactly on government, um, the religious, the endorsement by religious figures Um, will um, like contribute or help out the campaign. So you talked about a lot like access to certain universities, um, the command vote, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, meanwhile, in opposition, I would also think it's very important to sort of explain how exactly siding with the church today will make it so that the church or not necessarily the Catholic church, you know, like what I mean is a religious institution, how exactly they will be able to um, stop or hinder progress in the long run. Um, so I I really love this motion because you know me, Sigur Albert. <laughs> um, <laughs> religion motions are really my thing. So I, I'm super fascinated by the effect of um, religion in our lives, especially in politics. But yeah, yeah. So <laughs> I I also kind of wanted to add that I I think that this motion is kind of broad as well because who is the house, right? So I think mm-hmm. we've been talking so far about how it benefits the candidates, but there's also an angle here about how religions would benefit from their attachment to politics and making themselves continuously relevant by endorsing certain candidates or choosing not to endorse certain candidates. So I feel like that's an angle of exploration that certain debaters can take, especially if you know, you're know you're against someone that has taken all the angles on politics. Mm. So, so that's just okay. uh, my take as well. So we can move on now to the second motion. And it reads, this house opposes attempts to portray progressive political candidates as saviors from societal problems such as corruption, patriarchy, machismo, etc. And I love this topic. When I was in college, oh my God, that was like a while back. But when I was in college, <laughs> um, I made a paper about like the machismo culture here in the Philippines and how Duterte has used it to sort of shield himself and turn into a sort of deity or god in the eyes of so many people. And I feel like this motion talks about that directly. So I kind of want to ask here, um, since it's not just about, I mean, for, for this one, it's about progressive political candidates. What kind of saviors or do we see them as? And how do we, how, what's the best approximation of this that you can explain or witness here in the Philippines? I would, I would give examples of past presidents running campaigns that are or show some messianic tendencies. Like, for example, when Joseph Estrada ran, he was like, um, I will represent the Masa, I will save the Masa. So it somehow echoes very well into the consciousness of the voter, of the religious imagery, religious ideas they got from Um, the church about Jesus Christ being the Messiah, saving them from the poor. So I guess aside from his popularity as a celebrity and the campaign that he launched, the narrative worked well. And the next president to also run under the same campaign is Noy Noy, saying that ako yung gagawa ng daang matuwid or matuwid na daan. So it somehow was like a path towards salvation. And it again plays upon the, from my, from my perspective, the imagery of Jesus Christ showing the path, guide, guide us everyone, and something like that. And then the next person to do that, again, is Duterte. You know, like we all know what happened, changes coming, and stuff like that. And now in the, in the 2022 elections, you would see a certain candidate doing that as well. Um, imagery of them with uh, an animal like a tiger and a Philippine flag, and you know, promising all of the of all of the things that you know we would want in an ideal world. So all of this imagery perfectly plays well into the li- religious imagery that we were exposed to. As a, and it's again a reference to the first motion. But it also plays into the historical consciousness that we have as Filipinos because surprisingly, 
um, the revolutions that we created are largely again based on messianic narratives, which is why you you would see cults or groups supporting Rizal because he is the Messiah. Because surprisingly, the revolution was portrayed to be somewhat like that. And the revolutions that we had prior to the big revolution against the Spaniard or the uprisings that we had were largely religious in nature. People demanding that they have more representation inside the church. They would protest inside the church by holding mass, holding novena um, sessions and stuff like that. So, um, and then you have the Edsa revolution, which is like that as well. And if you would refer to the movement of civil rights movements in the United States and um, the anti-slavery movement that they've had also in the past, you will see a lot of religious identity um, being part of the revolution. But because, you know, we forget about how religion plays a big part and how it helps prop up uh, relig- this messiah narrative. And also because most of the revolutions that we've had in other countries as well, like for example, those that have gone through the communist um, regime are also playing in the messianic narrative, but we know how it played out eventually, like them having massive um, starvation and economic collapse and stuff like that. So I think this would uh, play for government case, yung propensity for failure, that if you don't make up for those promises, you would also anger the people and they would look for another messiah, which is why that would explain why re- um, administrations that ran under the same campaign messages ended up being toppled by another candidate or another uh, movement with the same campaign message. Like, for example, Joseph Estrada during the 1998 financial crisis. People were very mad because poverty, you know, worsened under his care, which is why they campaigned for Arroyo and the EDSA People Revolution Part 2. And the same for Noy Noy Aquino. Um, Duterte used um, the Messiah narrative against him and said that I'm the Messiah, actually. And that's actually the same narrative being played right now by one of the candidates. So I guess that, that's how I, I would say that this whole Messiah narrative plays into the religious imagery. But then I would also like to discuss what um, uh, would add to what Nina mentioned earlier about how our, our affinity to patriarchal or very macho images also comes into play. So I guess I would cite here Sharmila Parmanan. She mentioned in one of the Twitter spaces that I was part of that what Duterte did was to portray themselves as ano ba, tatay? Kaya, di ba, we, we hear words like tatay digong or um, I, I don't know if someone uses daddy Duterte, pero parang ganun. So that plays again in the imagery of savior because within the family, sino ba yung, sino ba yung nag, nag-provide usually in most families, it's the fathers. But, you know, again, this, this, is, uh, this can be questioned or challenged because majority of our families are usually run by women and held by women. But that's how people think in status quo. So they use, again, that imagery of the tatay as a savior and, you know, yung nangangaway ng mga corrupt, ng mga criminal, and would solve all those problems. And he eventually won the election. So I guess um, for opposition, all of those materials can be used for opposition. And uh, for government naman, I guess for government, as aside from the propensity for failure, you also, um, you also try to stifle or stop or delay democracy rebuilding after the administration that did a lot of chipping or a lot of butchering of the democratic system that we have right now. Because, of course, you would somehow confirm or affirm that the administration that took into power six years ago was actually right, you know, that, you know, all of these problems need to be saved by one certain savior. But at the same time, in the long run, all of your campaigns for empowerment, campaigns for how groups can um, be part of civil society or advocate for change would somehow be diminished or diluted with regard to their impact or um, their visibility. Because now, the reason why we were able to climb out of the crisis is because of the president that will be elected, not because all of us work together. So parang ganun din yung problema natin sa EDSA, people power, the Messiah was present, 
and all of the messaging was nilagay siya sa isang messiah and with the messiah failed dun na nagka problema so that's what i mentioned earlier about how why this is something that progressive shouldn't embrace but lastly i guess um that messiah messianic narrative also tries to portray progressive values as something as the end all be all of politics but we you know if you are a good progressive or a liberal you would know that you would have to listen to other people's ideas but if you're a messiah you don't have to listen to other people's ideas because you know that your ideas in fact is the only way out of prog- of of the problem and the way towards progress so kaya i would say government would have to emphasize here that progressives play the long game as opposed to just winning one election Uh, for opposition, ayun, um, you you would make empowerment not work for people. Uh, totally opposite of the argument government is uh, arguing. But you would also strengthen patriarchal and patri- patri- patronage politics. Mainly because um, people would see you as the reason why they are out of poverty. Not because of their own hard work and not because of the social services that they worked hard for as well. So parang um, the empowerment does not work in your case. Ano ba ba? Uh, so I guess basically um, yung opposition yung opposition ki- uh, opposition side here would say that the only way for you to win so parang nagkagulo na. Sorry. So ayan, I guess for opposition the only way for you to win in the elections is to play into the sensibilities that people have and not to you know, change their perceptions in just two to three months of the election. And the only only way that you can fight a powerful candidate or powerful candidates to play into the same imagery is to also co-opt that image or try to portray that you are also the same person. Um, I think that's the only time that people will start opening up to progressivism or progressive ideas because they know that you are their savior. So yung problem is government races nga na you're going to destroy democracy. Opposition can say na we'll fix it later, especially when you have six years, you can re-educate people, you can um, do a lot of democracy building with them. But the most important thing right now is to just win the election. Because all of the things that are happening in the election, hindi naman siya permanent. But these are things that you can work on and would discuss in the six years where in the uh, progressive candidate or progressive um, politician will be running or will be um, taking power. So I guess um, yun, um, that's for opposition in government. Sorry, medyo nagkagulo kanina with how my thought process works. No, I thought it was very comprehensive, actually. Um, in fact, I was going to ask you, like, how would you engage with a government side that says, you know, propensity for failure, it might damage the quality of political discourse and opposition. How would you respond to that? Thankfully, you already told us how to respond to that um, when you said that, well, yeah, it might damage um, the quality of political discourse, but we have the six years to fix that if you win. So now I wanted to ask the converse where, let's say opposition does say that, where You can re-educate, whatever. How would you reinforce that frame on government and, and say that, no, it's not that simple. You can't just re-educate people uh, into believing it. No, you, you should just let go of this wanting a savior type of mentality. And more than that, on government, how would you say, like, um, how would you impact the harm of, yeah, but what if we don't win? We we destroy or or damage the quality of future political discourse and we don't even win like how would you impact that as well on government i guess in government side i would uh, and 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 i i would say that in general philippine political culture and this is actually backed up by you know people opening up to alternative candidates like um those who are not supported or who are not aligned with the administration it's only during the election Um, which is why I'm not saying that protests are not important, but protests are somewhat ineffective because, again, this is linked naman to the third motion. It's because Filipinos are not open or not comfortable with open criticism, but they would be open to discussing these issues. They would be open to discussing their own social problems or personal problems, but they're not that courageous to stand up and criticize certain individuals. 
in non-election period. So parang for me, um, if government is going to talk about, uh, government is going to defend or is going to talk about it opposes any attempts to portray them as messiahs, I think the uh, uh, opposes any attempts is because, uh, is opposes any attempts is that election period is a very crucial time for people to think about where they are in society what is the value of their vote. And campaign messages actually are very strong in the national consciousness and personal consciousness of the Filipinos. Like we still remember the campaign jingles from the past elections, even if these people are not running for office. For example, like for example, Manny Villar, we still remember his campaign jingles or campaign rhetoric or even like Noemi Aquino. So our point of reference for how we understand and perceive and value democracy is actually during election time. That's a sad reality again, because you know, as debaters, we are educated that democracy is an ongoing process, as opposed to just like voting. But in reality, Filipinos actually think that democracy is voting, essentially. And um, this is again related to the third motion. They're not that open to um criticized, they're not also open to joining volunteer groups. Um, this is data mentioned in one Teka Teka episode. So surprisingly, Asia, Asia Foundation back or Asia Foundation's youth-led ATA uh, made this study or discovered that people aren't actually very open to, to participating politically. And it's only during elections you would see people being open about it. So, kailangan, during elections, careful karen because that's where you craft narratives about democracy. Um, I would, and also, yung sinasabi na, you know, you have six years to educate and all of that. Government can say that, yes, you would have six years to educate everyone about democracy and civic engagement. But people will be, will be still thinking about your campaign promises, will still be thinking about your campaign rhetoric, your jingle, which is why even six years after Duterte, we still remember his campaign promises in three to six months, I will end the war on drugs. And it somehow upsets us and disappoints many of us because that didn't happen. But we know that somehow people feared using drugs in the process. So parang government can use that example to their advantage and at the same time, how it can question the credibility of progressive groups in the future to make the same messaging or to situate or position their candidates as saviors again or people who uh, will provide for the people because they can have a reference point. And you didn't solve the problem in hunger or rising in oil prices. Things that I think that most candidates have very limited power to control. Because external forces like wars or um, tensions outside of the country can influence that actually. But because you promise that you will make life better for everyone during the election, people will remember that for the next six years or even for the rest of their lives. Like uh, the second example is EDSA People Power Revolution. Like people realize na um, hindi naman ganun gumanda yung buhay natin. But actually, economically, it did. But personally to them, hindi tayo naging Singapore after People Power Revolution. So parang it's important for us to be careful about the messages that we send out there because it will usually impact us in the, the, the participation of a political party later on, like liberal party. So I think that what we can get from this is really that the messaging that you have during your campaign, it cascades basically to how your entire term is going to look like as well as what people will think of you. Um, though this is debatable whether the effects are going to be that grave, I think we can agree that there is some level of like attachment that people have towards the narratives that you send forward. So this brings us perfectly, actually, to the third motion, which is this House, as an opposition candidate in the Philippines, would abandon criticism of incumbents as a primary strategy to win in an election. So I think we know basically what uh, this looks like here but just to clarify especially for our non-filipino um debaters um what does this look like what matter do people need to know especially when they're they're debating this motion um so i i watched one of the um Anuba, like uh, one of the coverages of the cnn vp presidential debate by rappler and what is striking is that the experts there they didn't mention the name of the person who mentioned it, but you can look it up in Rappler. Um, 
they mentioned that um, negative campaigning doesn't work anymore in the Philippines, unlike in the past election, because people aren't comfortable with criticism. And there are some studies that I actually saw online that talked about how people perceive negative campaigning and criticism of incumbents or people in power are like. So parang when I heard of that comment and when I saw some of those materials before we had this talk, I realized that, yeah, um, you know, that, that's where the motion plays out. And that made me understand why no matter how much opposition criticizes the current administration, people won't be open to discussing or open to supporting opposition in the criticism because of their uncomfortability with criticism. So examples like this might be youth groups, or progressive groups in the Philippines, like the Makabayan Bloc or Akbayan, criticizing the president for the pandemic response, or even um, pandemic response, or even how they handle the drug issue, or even how um, opposition candidates who or opposition politicians who are in power who have criticized the administration for different lapses and different corruption issues. People aren't actually open to negative campaigning or to to criticizing as a for as as one of the things that will make them buy into a certain idea or a certain group. So that's why in the past years you might understand now why the people in power have very really strong ratings, despite from our perspective as debaters as very lackluster performance or very troublesome performance. If you are a non-Filipino debater, one example I would mention is Narendra Modi. So during the pandemic, during the height of India's um, COVID-19 um, pandemic, people were criticizing him for the bad response. But actually, after the wave went down and the cases went down, people were generally supportive of him. And, you know, his administration succeeded that. And uh, what I heard was that the satisfaction ratings or support actually went up after that. So that's just an example of how in other countries, uh, in India, for example, negative campaigning might not work. But in European countries, in the United States, it, you know, works. Which is why in the 2020 elections to the United States, you see negative campaigning from the Democrats versus Donald Trump. But in the Philippines, I guess that wouldn't work at all because of people's um, uncomfortability with criticism. And I would link this with the first two motions, like talking about how people don't like their messiah or don't like the candidates that they elected in power being criticized by people who are not elected or people who do who they might not see favorably because they didn't vote for them or they're not part of their political bloc and stuff like that. So basically, the motion talks about these issues. So what I wanted to ask was, I mean, the whole basis of government's case is that negative campaigning, especially in the Philippines, doesn't seem to work that well anymore. And therefore, we need to change. The question is, to what should we change, right? Like, what kind of strategy should we shift towards? Especially considering that in all campaigns, right, it, you also need to be able to distinguish yourself from your rival, your rivals in the campaign season. So um, on government, how would you suggest um, teams to say, okay, this is our new strategy now. This is how we're going to distinguish ourselves from others but at the same time, not super criticize the incumbents. How would you do that? Um, I guess you would talk about talking more about your platform, amplifying the problems that we are facing right now and providing solutions for that, um, talking more about your credentials. Um, you might, you know, there might be some opportunities that you might question the credibility of other candidates from the administration or other parties you're running. But you won't want you don't want to name drop them. You don't want to like directly call them out, which is again mentioned by um, the uh, rappler uh, com- rappler coverage of the vice presidential debate that you know like direct calling out doesn't work, which is why you might see candidates talking more about their issues. I would say that uh, one of the things that you can derive from this is that it actually forces our democracy or forces our voters to look into platforms and issues 
more into the character of the person who is running because you now have uh, campaign teams or parties um, scrambling for how they will make their platforms more mabango or more attractive to voters as opposed to you know, focusing on how do we attack the other candidates or how do we attack other parties in the process. So, um, and the strategy might also be talking about like what their vision is for the country. So if we focus on that, it also provides the benefit that we are less more, we are less about personality politics, but we are more about the platforms that people are able to present to us. Because if people are uncomfortable with negative campaigning and criticism because of the Filipino psychology that we have or Philippine culture that we have that we don't like people na engage in paninira or you know discrediting other people, um, which is very Confucian actually in 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 nature because you want everyone to be in the same you want to be one with everyone you don't want some people to be excluded you don't want chaos you don't want disagreement so i guess people will be looking out more on what they have to offer as opposed to like listening to their criticisms or listening to fights between candidates. So I guess I want to ask before we end, like what personally do you think the strategy should be, for example, if um, you're encountering a team? So this is in the debate sense now. If the team says that you have a populace that is so used now to hearing, for example, attacks. So we're going back to government here. So they're so used to hearing attacks and it's become a culture, for example, to make politics personal. So how do you suggest in the long term that gets shifted? Um, I think in the long term, um, and I, I would also like uh, to, to cite, like, there are also uh, studies by NGOs that talk about, like, you know, people in the Philippines don't actually find politics to be very personal to them because um, I mentioned earlier in the other motion that they would find their faith as largely determined by an invisible being as opposed by politics, ideology, and their own hard work. So I would say that for government side, uh, you would focus more you, you would uh, focus more on discussing, platform because people would look more into that as opposed to like fighting with other people and even if they do take it personally they you you would have to anybody like um so uh if they would take it personally you would try to look into the common grounds that you have with other people because now you don't want to engage anymore in chaos with other supporters so the common ground that you have is the only way that you can, you know, convert each other or talk to each other. Because the more that you talk about, oh, this candidate actually said that this other candidate has this issue, you would just fight. But I guess um, this debate actually is very open to how voters will interact because voters are very free to talk about the issues of the candidate. And I guess in the long run, people will be more and more um, considerate of the track record and the background of the candidate because you don't hear any more of the fighting from the candidate, but voters are forced to find that information or are fed that information through media institutions and other distribution channels. So I guess for government side, you would uh, say that. And for opposition, I think that my defense here is that negative campaigning might not be working right now. But one of the game changers was when Walden Bello and you know Montemayor went all out um, chaotic in the debate. And that really somehow um, shook people because for the first time they heard, you know, people who questioned candidates who were leading or somewhat supported by administration or you know, somehow within the graces of the administration. Um, so you could use that one example that that actually is a game changer. But you would also talk about how Duterte has been very aggressive. Negative campaigning lang naman yung ginagawa niya in the past. So why can't progressives also continue that playbook as well? And, you know, um, and then also how people actually want an aggressive and brash political candidate as opposed to someone who's really nice because if you look again in our history, we find politics to be entertainment for most of us. 
And the only way that you can make it to the headlines is when you make drama out of it. If people aren't that very open to talk about issues, but they're more talking about like, you know, this candidate is sick, this candidate is a son or daughter of this other politician or other celebrity. So for you to be able to be relevant in the discussion, the only way you can do that is when you continuously be chaotic. Hindi naman sinasabi, and, and opposition's burden here is not to necessarily say that it's their only campaign strategy. They have other campaign strategies that they can invest in, but they would not un- abandon this as one of their campaign strategies. And I guess it's working for party list groups like Kabataan party list, they still have a huge support from the public and Akbayan, who those these two groups have been part of block or formations that have been very, very critical of the current administration. So I guess those examples can be used in opposition side. Yeah, so I really like that. Um, I suppose moving on from the debate because we have to end the episode now. Um, moving on, I feel like a good balance between that would be Something like, oh, this person is good, but... And then you you give like a lukewarm explanation of your doubts. So you, it yeah. doesn't seem like it's negative campaign. Like I found that like it's more effective if you try to make it like, I just have some lukewarm doubts. It's not really negative campaigning. It's just that it's just something. <laughs> I feel like people are more responsive to that kind of lukewarm criticism that isn't just outright negative campaigning. Yeah, so yeah. I feel like at this point, we can end the episode already. Um, I feel like now more than ever, debating is so important. And it's more important to show up, at least show up to, <laughs> to debate. What? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Tie back to elections, oh, right? Man. So, um, yeah, I think that's it for this episode of Debatable. We're so happy that the second um, iteration of Debatable Open also had someone like you in the roster for motion contributors because you're just so nice to talk to about these things um thank you like, thank you thank you yeah so so nice to have you over again um that's it for this episode and also for this series of post debate analysis for debatable open 2020 mm-hmm. we'll see you in the next one bye 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 thank you so much bye bye